learn from your word. Thank you for Dr. Lucilius. We pray that you may give him the word to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> All right, we're, we're dealing here with the authority scripture and it came to, number, uh, to the point that we're under authenticity. And uh, this involves the fact that because it's the authoritative word of God, it's infallible. Interesting in the uh, debates over uh, inerrancy. Uh, there were those, even in evangelical circles, that didn't like to use the word inerrancy in uh, teaching that there could be errors in the Bible when it comes to history or science and things of that kind. But uh, they said they rather use the term infallibility rather than inerrancy. But really, infallibility is a stronger word than inerrancy. If uh, something is infallible, then can it have any mistakes in it? And if you're an in, you're an infallible expert on something. You ignore everything there is about it, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. And so infallibility is really a stronger word than inerrancy. <coughs> infallible means that God, as a God of truth, cannot possibly err. Because he's infallible, he cannot possibly err. And so whatever the Bible speaks about, if it's the word of God, inspired about of God, then can it ever be a mistake? No. It can't be a mistake. But Jesus said, the scripture cannot be broken. <coughs> the scriptures cannot be broken. And he was talking about something that's only mentioned once in the Psalms, <coughs> once in the whole Bible. So if it's wrong one place, then what does he say about the whole Bible? Yeah, the whole thing is under is under question. If God's not <laughs> telling us the truth about creation in chapter one of Genesis, then how do you know he's telling us the truth about salvation in John three sixteen? And so this is uh, now they argue that that's not necessarily the case that uh, only the spiritual truths of the Bible are, are inerrant, but uh, necessarily uh, not necessarily the history or the, the scientific knowledge, but that. Uh, but when people read the Bible, when you teach your children the Bible, when they get, come to age, they, they come to that logical conclusion, well, if they're not right on Genesis, they're not right on the book of Romans either. And so uh, it's very important that we realize it. So inerrancy is a very essential uh, aspect of Scripture, and we have to stand for it. Now, you, <coughs> you find that certain issues become prominent at different times, and that's where you have to fight the battle. And uh, as Luther said, a soldier, he may be faithful everywhere, but if he's not faithful where the, where the attack is, he's not a real soldier. Mm -hmm. And so if the battle is over er inerrancy, then that's where we need to fight the battle. And uh, it's, it was uh, fought and uh, we fought one, one here in a, in, a couple, in a generation or so ago, but now it's starting to rabble under, around the edges again in the so-called evangelical world. I don't even use the word evangelical anymore because uh, it can mean any, anything. And it's kind of fun to believe it, especially with postmodern thinking has gotten into the, 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 the idea of progress. And, and uh, even in our knowledge of the, of the Bible and God are progressing. Well, in some sense, that's true. You learn more and more. But it changes to, to suit the, uh, the times. And that's not true. The Bible doesn't ever, it doesn't ever suit the times. It changes to suit the times. It doesn't change for the world, it's here to change the world. Change us, not uh, you and I change it. And so when we talk about in inerrancy, we're talking about the fact that the Bible has uh, no errors in any kind of any kind. Whether it's talking about theology, whether it's talking about science, that's not a science book, but whenever it mentions things that are scientific, if they're accurate. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that gives, gives any room for any kind of theory of evolution. You know, it's theistic evolution or atheistic evolution. In fact, theistic evolution is just atheistic evolution without the A. It's, it's an atheistic humanistic theory, and they're trying to make it fit with the Bible, and especially the time element. The age, the age of the earth is a big issue, and there are many even who are creationists, but are old age creationists. In other words, they don't believe in the... the literal six-day, 24-hour day creation. And uh, they have been uh, overwhelmed by the so-called evidence that the Earth is billions of years old. The universe is 
it is so old, 14, 13, 14 billion years old, and, uh, and the Earth itself, the solar system is four and a half billion years old. Amazing how they know that. They throw, away, they throw around billions of years like the government throws around money. So it's, uh, but uh, <coughs> it's, uh, but they have to do a, do a real hatchet job on the book of Genesis chapter one to do that. And they have to find all kinds of uh, different interpretations of Genesis one to make it fit with science. As, what, as science teaches. But if what science teaches is contrary to the Bible, then what about science? Mm -hmm. It's wrong. Right. It's wrong. And uh, I know there's times when the, when the Bible was, was interpreted wrongly. In other words, to get the idea that the world is flat because the sun rises and sun sets and so on, and in in the, so on. Uh, that was a faulty interpretation of scripture. The Bible does not teach the world flat. It teaches the world is round. But uh, so it wasn't uh, in that particular case. The, the conflict between science and the Bible was not the problem of the Bible, but con pro problem of the church interpreting the Bible. In fact, in the case uh, they used the case of, uh, of uh, oh, what's his name now, the, the one who wanted the, the bishops to look through the. Telescope to see the moon, he wouldn't look because. <laughs> and Galilee. Right? Galileo. Galileo, yes. Galileo. Yeah. Well, Galileo was a creationist. He he believed that uh, they were, the Bible was being interpreted wrong by them. But Galileo wasn't only in conflict with the church at that time, at least some of the church. He was in conflict with science because all the scientists of the universities were Aristotelians. And they had, they had an opposite uh, paradigm for, that had to be completely removed. And on top of that, there are those in the church, even in the Middle Ages, who believed the world was round. Uh, in fact, uh, Copernicus was a, was a churchman, and Kepler were both churchmen, and who believed in, in uh, creation, and, and believed that uh, the Bible teaches that there are laws that, are, that God has given, and therefore you can have science, possibly. And so really the problem that, that the church had at that time was that they were accepting the, theor the theories of science. When the theories of science changed, they were left hanging out in the, in the open. So, uh, yet we, we recognize that the scriptures in there. Uh, there's different efforts uh, down through history for where, where liberals and uh, skeptics have tried to show where the Bible's in air in, in some kind of historical event and so on. But the more evidence comes in, every turn of the archaeologist uh, shovel turns up more and more evidence that the Bible is accurate on all its uh, statements. The old uh, higher critics used to think that Moses couldn't have written the Bible, the Pentateuch, because he didn't have writing back then. Well, they, had writing, they found out there's writing way back even beyond uh, Abraham. Uh, in fact, Daniel could not have been uh, an accurate historical record because there was no record of a Belshazzar in the, in the kings of Babylon. Well, look what they had. Look around, they find another uh, archaeological find and they finally find out that there were two kings at the time when Belshazzar, when, when, when Daniel and, and the handwriting on the wall took place. Uh, there was the, the king and Belshazzar was his son. And remember God said, uh, or he, well, he said, if you can read the handwriting, I'll make you the third ruler of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. But there was already one and two rulers. So, uh, uh, but uh, that Belshazzar was a king. And that uh, he was actually ruling in, Bel in Babylon when his father was out trying to fight the, fight the, uh, the Persians. And so it's, uh, no need to be afraid. Brother Van Shatner one time said, if a science comes to believe what the Bible says, uh, that doesn't give any more authority to the Bible. It doesn't, more, uh, it doesn't build up my view of the Bible, this builds up my view of the scientist. <laughs> So uh, you can trust the Word of God for what it says. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, though, uh, all these things don't prove the Bible's true. You can never prove completely. You can. Did a shift come through? Okay. That's some commentary on the teaching. <laughs> you can never positively pr prove the Bible's truth historically. 
because there's some things again it would ever never be able to prove. For instance, how can you prove that uh, Rebecca went and got the, got the water from for the canyons for Abraham's servant and so on? But uh, when it comes to the ultimate proof of the scriptures are the word of God, the Holy Spirit gives that to the heart of the regenerate. Apologetics and all these things are important to be able to, to remove these obstacles from people who use them against the scripture. But then it still comes to this point where the word of Holy Spirit has to use the word of God to convict that person. And you'll never be able to convince them merely by arguments and evidences. That whole area is a very interesting thing to me. I could spend a lot of time on that. But uh, sufficient to say we'll leave it there. We come now to number four, Roman number four, the preservation of Scripture, the preservation of the Bible. And of course, this is a big debate in our day. And most in the uh, Christian world is not a debate, it's really settled, but uh, there's some rantankers, fundamentalists around who uh, still believe in the King James Bible and, and the received text, and so the debate, debate still rages in that area. Uh, just for some preliminary thoughts, <coughs> uh, well, number one, the, we have to lay rather, the Bible is an eternal book. Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So before even the first word of the Bible was written, God had the word of God preserved in heaven. Now you think if the word is, is forever settled in heaven, God's going to lose it somewhere in time? No, the word of God is never going to be lost. It's going to preserve, persevere, preserve, all down through the centuries. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never, or shall not pass away. Matthew. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And of course, these would have to be written words, wouldn't they? Because the words he spoke in the, in the air are gone, but uh, written words. So time has not destroyed, diminished, or distorted the word of God. It has the promise of divine preservation upon it. Because it is the word of God, the eternal God. The inspiration of alone would declare that the word of God has to be preserved. It's God's word. It has the nature of God. Right? That's got to be the Bible is an enduring book. Of it, and the promise of it will endure forever. 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25. For all flesh is as grass, and all the flower of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. So it's not going to settle in heaven, but it's going to endure forever. Now, has there ever been a book more hated and attacked in the Bible? Yet no book has lasted as long, has been as popular as long as the Bible. Someone said it's the anvil that's worn out all the hammers. And then pound on it, but the hammers wear out. But the anvil still stays the same. Human reasoning has been raised up against it. Satanic attacks of all kinds. Men have uh, still clung to the Bible, studied the Bible, read the Bible, even though they knew if they were caught, it would be a death sentence. And there were times in history when uh, saints were burned at the stake with their Bibles hung around their necks. And, uh, in fact, there's still some copies of called the Martyr's Bible. <clears throat> when Mary, Mary uh, Bloody Mary reigned in England, uh, there's still some of those Bibles that have survived. And, uh, and you can look at the thing and see the, the mark of the, 
the blood of people on it. And, and the, in fact, you knew that the one who wore, wore that uh, had, had died for, for believing that book, and having that book. Right, uh, next would be the, the entire Bible endures. The entire Bible endures. Is that C or is that just a... Well, let's see. I guess you can make it uh, one and two. Yeah. The entire Bible endures. This, of course, would be, would be covered in the canonicity of the Bible. Today. The canonicity. We studied that in the whole section. Mm -hmm. That the books were collected as they were written, and the people of God recognized them. It wasn't something that was authorized by some politi or political or ecclesiastical authority. It was recognized by the people of God. And the uh, whole canon of Scripture, the whole list of books that are in the inspired Bible, have endured and continued. So canonicity is covered in that kind of thought. All right, the uh, <clears throat> we come then to preservation. When we talk about the entire Bible enduring, we're talking also about not just the books are enduring, but the text, the, word, the words in the Bible are enduring. There's so sort of you should come. <clears throat> so I don't know how you want to outline this because this is a whole study by self preservation. But, uh, one of the problems that has arisen <laughs> in this matter of the text, textual criticism, I call it. Especially when it started with Westcott and Hort back in 1881, the, uh, <coughs> the premise was, and this goes even back before when the critics, critical system started working, um, was trying to find the original scriptures in the text, was that the Bible was treated as any other book, and then the science of textual criticism was used to to determine uh, the proper readings. Textual criticism is not somebody trying to criticize the Bible, you know, like, like uh, where a man's wife could criticize him, or you criticize somebody of each other. It means that you take a, <coughs> you try to s take a document and try to search and have different readings of that document, try to find out which is the oldest and original reading of that. And so you have uh, very evident, we have copies of the Bible now. You don't have the original autograph, you have the original scriptures because they've all worn out. So we have copies of copies of copies. And so these copies differ with one another because people make mistakes when they copy. So uh, the question is, uh, which are these different readings? They're called variants. Whenever you have one text, uh, one, one manuscript differs from another manuscript, uh, that's called a variant. And, uh, and so they have to figure out, they're trying to figure out how do you get back and which one was the one, say, that the Apostle Paul wrote? And uh, or Apostle John, or and so on. And so, uh, textual criticism was uh, used to try to do, to do that. It's still being used to do that. But it's uh, based on the premise that, that the Bible is treated like any other book. But is the Bible in just like any other book? No. no. Now, <clears throat> we believe <laughs> that the Bible is the source of all knowledge. The Bible is, uh, you want to find out about, about something, you believe about something, where do you look? You look at the Bible. So where should you look about the, the preservation of the Bible? Um, In the Bible, yeah. <coughs> you don't look to textual criticism. Now, it may be a way of using and, and, and uh, helpful, but you still have to recognize that the Bible 
says of itself that it is to be divinely preserved. And it's preserved through its people, through the church. And preserved through all time, all generations. In fact, this is what the <coughs> Westminster Confession and the old London Baptist Confession and the Philadelphia Baptist Confession believe that God has, believe that God has preserved his word <coughs> through, for his, through his people through every generation. Now let's look back again at chapter, 2 Peter chapter 2, 3, maybe. If this verse really opened up to me and helped me this uh, summer in having to preach on these things. Second Peter 2. Uh, Second Peter 3, <coughs> number verses 15 and 16. And the kind that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. And we noted this, that uh, first of all, that Paul wrote his epistles by divine wisdom. And we took the time we studied inspiration that in the book of 1 Corinthians that uh, Paul tells us that he was able to use spirit-taught words to communicate the revelation of God. That they did not uh, write with, with the words that man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. And so there is no doubt a word of wisdom that is spoken of in 1 Corinthians 12. So there's inspiration. Paul's letters then are inspired scripture. Tells us so. This was recognized even in the first century, uh, before the before the uh, first century ended. This is in the 60s. Then we also noted when we studied the canon that Paul's letters must have been copied and distributed, right? Because how did Peter know about Paul's epistles, and how did these people in Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia and Galatia, as you see in First Peter 1:1, 1, 1, have copies to know about? Well, they must have uh, rapidly copied them and distributed them around. We saw in 1 Timothy 5 that Paul already recognized Luke's gospel as scripture. And so Paul's letters were not only scripture, but they're called scripture, but they're also copied scripture. But now notice something else. We know that, the, that when Paul wrote the letter, that he wrote it by inspiration, didn't he? Even when he dictated it, it was, it was inspired words that were written down by whoever he dictated to. And so uh, we know that that original autograph, and so we can have this term. something that's mobile by itself. In other words, it's got an engine that goes by itself. You don't have to have a, have a horse pull it or, or, or a camel or somebody push it. All right, so out of graph, graph is, is to write. Grapho is the Greek word to write. And so autograph is something you wrote yourself. And so you write your name, autograph. Well, the original writing then of somebody would be called the autograph. Autograph. And we knew that that process was so superintended by the Holy Spirit that the very words in that original autograph were the infallible inspired word of God. 
And so it's called Scripture. But now these epistles of Paul have been copied, and a number, a lot of copies have been made. They're, they were collected together in what they call the Pauline corpus and distributed. And so here are these people all over Asia Minor, and Peter's writing to, he himself must, must have had a copy of it, had Paul's writings, and notice what they're still called. What are they called? Scriptures. So that was it. It's not just the original autograph is called scripture. What else is called scripture? Copies. The copy. The apocrypha. Apa means from. So autographa, autograph is the original writing. Apographa would be the writing that came from the original one. Now, if the copy is exactly the same as the autograph, then if the autograph is inspired, what would the copy be? Inspired. You see, it's, it's not the Bible writer who's, who's inspired, it's the Bible that's inspired. And so the copy is also inspired. Now, suppose you copied that, you translated that copy into another language. But it would not have then the same words, would they? Mm. And it would not have the exact, uh, the exact nuances of the original. But if the, cup, if the translation taught the same thing in substance as the, as the, uh, the original, then would that copy not be also the Word of God? Mm -hmm. it, it'll be the Word of God in, the, in as much as it, it accurately it reflects the original. Friends, we believe that this is a translation, even with King James writers. You read the, the uh, uh, preface to the readers, in it, and they believe that this even could be improved. They did the best they could, and they did a good job. But they believe it could be improved. Somebody should do it sometime, someday. But uh, they said even the basest effort by somebody who is, a, who is skilled in, in copying and in translating, and by base, he doesn't mean it's a... It's a, it's a job but it was a, of a more humble nature than, uh, than they tried to do, it would still be the Word of God if it still said the same thing. So the Bible writers, uh, the Bible translators, the King James translators, were not inspired. They did not give an inspired translation. They translated the inspired Greek and Hebrew that they had. So it said the writers were not inspired, but the Bible itself was inspired? Yeah. We think of sort of being inspired like Shakespeare or anything right else. But when it comes to inspiration, it's the, now the Bible, the, the writers were mentally picked up by the Holy Spirit so that what they recorded was inspired. In other words, inspired means it was God breathed. Yeah. Like your words are breathed out. So the Bible was breathed out through the instrumentality of Bible writers. So God has uh, not re-inspired the Bible every time you know a new translation is made. Why couldn't that be very wise? Well, first, okay, there's, there is a view <coughs> uh, of some King James advocates that, that the King James translators were re-inspired to write the English mm -hmm. translation. Uh, but they themselves denied this in their, in their induction. But <clears throat> what evidence is, do we have that they were inspired? For instance, how did, how did the original uh, prophets evidence that they were inspired? They had signs and wonders and, and credentials, did they not? Well, God would have to do that every generation for every inspired, every, inspired, uh, or every translator. How would he know that this man was a real inspired man to translate that right? And then somebody over here said, well, no, our prophet inspired it this way, and this, our prophet inspired it this way. Which one is the right prophet? See? But instead, we can, go out, we, we can always go back to 
the manuscripts to check whether a translation is, is, is good or not, and whether it's accurate or not, or whether this reading is correct or not. So in other words, God has given us, the, it's, it's through the autographs and the apocrypha, in other words, the copies of those, that we can go back and uh, check translations. In fact, uh, preachers should be able to know the original scriptures when they teach and preach it, where they can uh, uh, really go back and see what Paul really said and Moses really said and so on, so that they can bring out the, uh, the truths of the scripture in a more fuller, detailed way. Okay, well, I have to give you kind of a bird's eye view of the whole issue and the problem of the textual issues. I'm not a textual critic. And so some would argue that I don't have any business even talking about this, because I'm not one of the experts. But as I said before, we, we look to the Bible as the source of information about everything. And so what does the Bible say about its own, its own, pres its own preservation? We've already read that it's settled in heaven and that uh, heaven and earth will pass away. We said, my word will never pass away. And so God has promised its preservation, hasn't he? Uh, let me just give you some scriptures here. <clears throat> Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now this particular passage has a debated as far as uh, interpretation. Some say that that section where it says, Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever, is talking about the, about the saints here have been mentioned in the previous paragraph. Others say that, that it's referring to the words of God. And it seems to be that the words here are the immediate uh, uh, antecedents to the statement here, to the pronouns for instance, them, that's referring to the words that God will preserve forever. Uh, and we saw in Psalm 119.89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Word, verse 152, concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast found, founded them forever. And then verse 160, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy words, a righteous judgments, endureth forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of the Lord, word of our God, shall, shall stand forever. <coughs> Matthew 5, 18, 17 and 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. There he, see, there he uses law and prophets to refer to the whole Old Testament. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now what's he mean by a jot and a tittle? The Hebrew markings. Yeah. A jot, they believe, is the yod. The smallest letter in the uh, Hebrew, like a little comma. So it's like crossing your eyes and dotting your T's? Yeah, kind of like that. But so what do Arabic have a yoga? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Come on, Michael. There is no Arabic for yoga. Well, that's a, it's a, yeah, it has the, uh, the Y sound. The Y? Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Yeah, what's it look like? This looks like that. Look at our big people last night. That's a little bigger than that. Okay. <laughs> that's a lot. Is it a yes? That's not a yes. That's a yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, and then the uh, the the, uh, yeah. the tittle uh, Greek word is karia, which means horn. But they believe it's a little different between letters. For instance, you take the letter uh, uh, Daleth. And 
the letter Resh. See the difference between the Zolot and the Resh? That's called a tip. <laughs> See, the Resh has a and the and the Dalit, and the Resh is this way. Or a Beth or a cough. Mm. Cough in Arabic too. Right, so that's the difference between the two. So those little differences are called a uh, tittle. So in other words, uh, the little distinguishing marks between the very letters say won't pass away. Mm -hmm. Talk about verbal inspiration, that's really getting down to it. Okay, that's uh, pretty well covers that. I gave you the other one. Have an inertia pass away, but my words should never pass away. Uh, John 10, 35. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scriptures cannot be broken. Psalm 105, verse 8, he hath commanded, or he hath remembered his, <coughs> he hath remembered his uh, covenant forever, the word which he commended for to a thousand generations. Psalm 111, 7 and 8, the works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and righteousness. Some, some argue that this does not <clears throat> mean then that uh, God's going to preserve the whole text of the Bible uh, in every generation. <clears throat> but of course, why not? How did he preserve it in the Old Testament? It had a history, didn't it? You saw how it was collected, put in, and who, and who was it responsible to collect the scriptures and preserve it in the Old Testament? The priests. The priests, yeah. And so <clears throat> they would uh, make sure that uh, it was preserved. And of course, sometimes <clears throat> God did so supernaturally in the case of uh, I remember when uh, Josiah had his revival, they were cleaning out all the trash in the house of God, and here they found the Bible there. And uh, that was probably the, the copy that was, was preserved by the priests. In the case of Jeremiah, when his writing was uh, burned, well, God supernaturally produced it again. So in the New Testament, <coughs> the, the church is the, is the, is the priesthood. First Peter chapter 5, or chapter 2, verses 5 and 8. And it's been the church's responsibility down through history uh, to preserve the, uh, the Word of God. <clears throat> and he has, and there's a history. So here's the big issue. Uh, let's just give it, get into the details now about, about the issue of you know, preservation in the Scripture. First, we'll look at some uh, uh, overall information you need to know. Some textual terminology, the definition of terms. First of all, it's the word manuscript. <clears throat> a manuscript is a copy of a Bible portion, a handwritten copy. And it's usually M S for one. More than one is MSS. Manuscript is a copy. Yeah, it's a copy, a written copy of a portion of scripture. 
Now we had manuscripts that cover almost the whole of the New Testament. Now you have some that only cover the book, the Gospels, and some only cover the Pauline Epistles. And then you have a little part, little pieces sometimes that maybe only that big. So there's all kinds of uh, portions. So these are all called manuscripts and are given different names over the years. Now there's, a, there's a debate as to whether there are families of manuscripts, but uh, it seems that some of them uh, have characteristics that are similar. They might have the same kind of variance in them, or same kind of characteristics. And so they're, they're called families. Families of manuscripts. Now there's the word text. A text is a printed edition of the New Testament, or even of the Old Testament. A text is a printed edition. Now you wouldn't have any text until you had printing. Whenever movable type was, this, was, uh, was invented for the printing press, and the Gutenberg Bible was the first thing printed on it. Uh, then we have uh, the Rasmus, for instance, gathering a number of manuscripts, and from them, uh, combining them into a text. A text. So a text is a printed edition. And in that edition, they've, they've done uh, editing. They've, cho they've chosen to not put this right reading here, but this one here. If they have two manuscripts that conflict with each other. This here is the, uh, it's called the received text. The text that's behind the King James Bible. The one, uh, Erasmus was the, the first one. But there's about 30 different editions of the, of the received text that, had, that came out of that. But uh, now sometimes we talk about a text type. Or a text form. That would be a text with a capital T. So you have the uh, critical text. Or the majority text, or the received text. And these are names that are given for groups of manuscripts that are all put together. And this, of course, is the big, <clears throat> the big issue today is between the critical text and the Majority or the Byzantine text. It's also called the ecclesiastical text. One calls it the church text. Dean Bergon calls it the traditional text. In other words, traditional is what the church has used down through the history. Majority is because it, it has about 90% of, it, these texts all agree about 90%, and these over here only about 10%. So they disagree from this 90% agree, 10% talk. So it's called the received text, it's called the Byzantine text because it came through the Greek world, in the Greek world. Ecclesiastical text or church text because this is the text the church has used uh, down through the centuries. Basically, this view, because it's based on, on uh, Alexandrian manuscripts, it's, it's accepted because it, they are the oldest. That's their argument. This is except, is the, the, the argument for this, this line of text is that it has the mostest, <laughs> the most. And that this has the history. History of the church's acceptance of it. In other words, 
The argument here is that this one has been preserved through the church down through history. And so where this argues from the standpoint of a scientific position, on, as uh, Dr. Brother Van Cleef calls it, a science project, this one argues on the basis of a, of a theology, theological position of the doctrine of preservation. If God said he's going to preserve his, his Bible to every generation, he's done it through this way. He hasn't done it through this way because he jumped from the 4th century, 4th and 5th centuries, down into 1880, the 1800s and 1700s. Well, this was continued down through history. See the difference? There's no history for this one. There's a history for this one. Okay, uh, another term you need to learn is uh, variant. Variant. V A R I A N T E. Variant. A variant is the difference between one manuscript and another. The difference between one manuscript and another? Yeah. If, uh, if one manuscript does. Uh, Spells one word one way, another one spells it a different way. Which, by the way, most of the value, most of the variants have to do with spelling and word order and things of that kind. And down two centuries, spelling change. Ever read a 1611 King James Bible in your years? Mm -hmm. They're different, are they? As far as spelling, for instance. Uh, Sometimes John's name is spelled with two moons and sometimes with one. Now, that affect, would that affect the translation any? How do you translate Ioannis? J O H N. <laughs> you see? It wouldn't affect the translation at all, would it? Mm -hmm. I don't think I spelled John right, but I thought we'd be making a copy of error if I did that. Anyway, the difference between the two would be a variant. Now, uh, someone said there's some 400,000 variants in the, in the manuscripts. There's 5,000, I think 730, the last count. And no two of them are alike. And so uh, there are some who argue then that how can you have an inspired and found the Bible? Well, it's because copies make mistakes that make the Bible invalid, make, make, make mistakes in the Bible. Uh, Paul didn't make any mistakes when he wrote it, you see. So, but when you figure that the vast majority of them are spelling, and others are word order, for instance. Uh, uh, if we have a statement like dog, Bites man. Dog would be the subject, right? Mm -hmm. This is the verb. Man would be the direct object. The dog, suppose he said, man bites dog. And that would make headline, wouldn't it? Man would be the subject. Dog would be the object. But in the Greek, if dog is in the nominative case and man is in the accusative case, dog would be the subject, man would be the object. If you wrote it this way, if man was still in the accusative case and dog was in the nominative case, dog would still be the subject, man would still be the object. So it doesn't matter what order it is, uh, you, you get the subject by the case it's in, the ending. So uh, even if you might have uh, written it one way and it come out 
if somebody else wrote it differently, it would still be saying the same thing. I think someone has broken it down about those 400,000. There's probably only 50 that really affect any kind of doctoral teaching. Now that's quite a job of personal preservation in, in, in by itself. When you think that you only have just a handful of copies of, uh, of uh, plate of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, Homer's Iliad and, and the uh, other ancient writings, and they are very old. Their copies are very old. They go sometimes. Uh, hundreds of years from the, from the original. And yet we have uh, manuscripts that go up even into the second century. There's some unseals that are within, say, 50 years of John. And uh, <coughs> in the uh, third, third and fourth centuries. And we have all of these, 5,000 plus, nearly 6,000, uh, that make up all these manuscripts. So it's very plain that God has preserved it even with all the arguing over the details. <coughs> now these variants, most of them, right, you have the 90% uh, then you have the 10%. Actually it's really between, not just 10%, but between basically two manuscripts, <coughs> plus all, I guess all these. There's less variance among these than there is among these. The biggest piece is between these and these. And even these differ among themselves. So there's more uniformity to these who come down through history. We call them majority text. All right, let's just give a few more details and we'll get into that next time into this. Uh, material that's used for copying. And the earliest copies were papyrus. Michael ever heard of papyrus? Mm -hmm. You can't go to see the pyramids without getting steered into a papyrus making place so you can buy some. It's made out of a reed in the, that grows by the Nile River. You, know, you get the word paper from it. It's just weaved back and forth and beat until it comes. But, problem, it, but the problem with papyrus is that though it's good writing material, uh, it doesn't last as long. And they have found papyrus manuscripts. They're all from Egypt because Egypt is, has a climate that they can survive. Another material that uh, replaced papyrus was vellum, B E L L U M. This is animal skins. Animal skins. It's B E L L U M. And some could be very expensive. For instance, the Sinaiticus or Vaticanus were made out of uh, antelope skin. That's very expensive. So it could had to be very rich to be able to afford them. Now, first they were written in scrolls. Roll. Of course, no, the average church member didn't, didn't have a copy. How'd you like to take your Bible and a scroll? The book of Revelation is 13 feet long. Okay, turn to chapter 13. <laughs> <laughs> this was replaced by a codex, the C O D E X, which was like a book in which the uh, the writing material was placed on top of each other and they were bound together. It's just like, like a book. Now the types of writing. Some of the oldest manuscripts, the ones that, that are called unseals, are called unseals because they're written in large letters, unseals. Or majuscules. <laughs> Let me see if I get majuscules right there. This. Hmm. 
unseals. When kids go to school, they learn different between unseals and cursors. Okay, and those are capitals. Now, for instance, you get to uh, the Vaticanus and the Sinaitics. All the Greek letters are capitals, all put together, no separation between words, no punctuation. What does that say? He is now here, Gordon. He is now here. Oh, he is nowhere. He is nowhere. Either way. So you wouldn't, since so there's no punctuation really, and that's how they were written. The answer that. And the oldest ones that are found, in fact, the, mess, the uh, Sinaiticus and uh, Alexandrinus, the uh, Vaticanus are all unsealed. In fact, sometimes they're noted by that. Usually they're noted by capitals. A is for the Alexandrinus, B is for the Vaticanus. And when Tischendorf found the Sinaiticus, he thought it was so important he had started different letters. He said it's Ella. That was the first letter of the Hebrew Bible. Hebrew letter. Hebrew. And the big issue today is really between whether reading is between those who accept this as the, uh, I'm sorry, not B. These as the uh, authority uh, originals and the uh, all the rest. So it's actually between all of these traditional text manuscripts and uh, Aleph and the Vaticanus. Aleph and B. Most cotton hoard just uh, bet the they bet the farm on that I can't since so yeah. yet. But then this was was uh, there was a kind of a communication uh, change. Uh, like you turn like you like you move from uh, typewriters to kind of computers. They had a uh, copying revolution in which they moved papyrus to vellum early in the fourth century, and then from unsealed to cursive. Unsealed to the cursive or the, or the minuscules. Now, most of the manuscripts that uh, <coughs> back up the, like the King James Bible, the traditional text of Byzantine text, are found in the, in the, as minuscules. The ninth and 10th century. They say, well, these are not very old. But remember, just because a copy may be Ninth to tenth century doesn't mean the text on it is. It, it, it would have to be older. You see, not older. 
And what happens when you shift from one to the other, they stop using the ones you had before, and sometimes get, they're worn out or they get rid of them. And so you might have, uh, for instance, they've, they've gone into uh, some of the scriptoriums where they had scribes and that copies documents. Uh, they went into that. There's one. There was one at Sinai, my Sinai. There was one at uh, Mount Patmos, another one at Jerusalem. And they looked and saw all these different daughters. They, they were copies, but they found no parents. Which meant that they must have, and this is true in all of them, so they must have destroyed the original that they copied from. And so just, so the, the age then of a copy of a manuscript is no indication of the age of the text on it. In fact, they must have been copied from something before or it wouldn't be a copy, would it? But just because uh, you don't have old copies does not mean you don't have an old, you don't have a, uh, an original text of some kind. They found some uh, manu some vellum manuscripts that uh, <coughs> had been the original writing had been scraped off, and then something else had been written on top of it because the material is so so valuable that they still want to use it. And so they found some manuscripts underneath others. But what had happened is that these this manuscript had been copied, and so it was no longer used for scripture, and so they scraped it off and used it for something else. And so the idea there is that. The reason why we don't have old, old copies of things is because they're used up, or when they, when they move from one to another, like uh, uh, unsealed to cursive, and from uh, uh, papyrus to vellum, then the, the parent document is, is destroyed or used for something else, while the uh, copy then is continued. Okay. Now, of all these 5,000, I think 730 manuscripts, many of them, of course, are, are manuscripts, unsealed and cursed massive manuscripts. Others are from what they call lectionaries, L-E-X-I-O-N-A-R-I-E-S. Dictionary. These are copies that were read in the churches. In other words, that were read periodically during the worship of the, of the churches. And most of them are from the Gospels and say the Pauline Epistles. But they are copies of the texts that were read in the churches. Another source of uh, information for early, early uh, in this matter of the tracing out the original manuscripts uh, early translations. For instance, you have the, the uh, Apostle Paul started his missionary journeys in Syria and Antioch. Antioch and Syria. And uh, but the people of Syria spoke Aramaic. And so you have the Syriac version, which is a translation of the New Testament Greek. We're talking, we're, we're talking about New Testament because the Old Testament, Jews did a great job of copying the Old Testament. And so uh, there's not that much problem in the Old Testament. But it's the Greek New Testament that has all the, very, all the big, so many manuscripts to deal with. But you have the Syriac version. Then you have the Gothic version. When the Gospel moved out into uh, uh, northern or east, western Europe, among the Goths, the uh, language there was, the Bible was translated into that language. Then, of course, you have the Latin, early Latin translations. Later on, you have the Latin Vulgate, but even before that was the Italic versions. And the interesting thing about those is that these verses are, are all, uh, these ancient versions are Byzantine, and they're the same as our majority text. And then there's also the, the, the quotation of the Bible in early church fathers. If you read the early church fathers, they would quote a scripture, and then you could tell what text they used, if they differed from, from one another and differed from different texts. It's been said that if you lost all the manuscripts, you could repro reproduce it from the writings of the early church. 
So all of these are information that feed into the issue of how do you, uh, uh, which uh, text is closest to the New Testament text. Okay, time for question.